timing. And we are live with Grant Fox. Grant, good. I guess it's evening, isn't it? G'day, mate. How are you? Good, Pat. Yeah, it's getting that way. It's getting a bit darker outside. Darker down here in Dunedin than it is up there. Are you in Auckland? I'm assuming you're in Auckland. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Auckland, yeah, but lighter in the summer down there at this time of night. So, yeah, 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 very true. Hey, hey, thanks so much for uh, jumping in and having a bit of a chat with us. I, I put up on my Facebook page, um, you know, they say don't talk to your childhood heroes. And being a boy who grew up in the 80s in Auckland uh, and, uh, and having a father who basically if we weren't into rugby, we were disowned and, uh, you know, at Eden Park every week, uh, you know, there's a few of you guys up there who was when I was in my teens were certainly the the Michael Jordans of my life, and you're one of them, so it's pretty cool to be talking to you. That's very kind of you, and I re- well remember your dad. I got refereed by him on many occasions, and <laughs> I hope I didn't give him too much advice, but <laughs> knowing me, I probably did. Yeah, well, I've said this before. Um, dad was president of the Auckland Rugby Referees Association for a wee while there, so actually lucky enough to, you know, he'd get tickets to the after-match functions for the Auckland Games and stuff, and we'd be in there watching... With, I would be watching with wide eyes these uh, these these big men who just come off the fields in the old days when there used to be after match functions. Now I'm going to say yeah. as an assumption, like Super Rugby and even NPC, are those all gone by the wayside? Do they still have a, a beer afterwards officially? Look, I, I can't tell you uh, specifically, but I'm guessing around Super Rugby for the most part, the answer is probably no. Yeah, uh, players might get together in a dressing room after a game, you know, have a beer yep. or a soft drink or whatever. I might attend Cup, uh, maybe, maybe not. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, they run professional outfits now, and there's a whole lot of cost out in other areas of the game. So, you know, putting on an after match function does come at a cost. So, I guess that's all part of the, you know, the landscape nowadays. Yep. All black test matches, because we almost play exclusively at night. I know they don't happen, which is sad. Um, on a on a rare occasion, we might we might have a little get together. We did with Wales um, a couple of years ago, and you know, I remember in Dunedin, we went somewhere afterwards and. Teams got together, but often we'll go to the, the the visiting team will come to the dressing room, yeah, and you know we'll have a beer and you know share a story once you've all blim and shout up. But that takes a while nowadays because the recovery process after a big game is very scientific, yeah. <laughs> and it takes a bit of time before you get to the point where the boys are all scrubbed up again and you know and, and, and can I guess have guests in the room. But um, it's a sad part of what doesn't happen today, but it's also re- the reality of also you know where the game is. I don't want to be one of those people who kind of um, gets into, oh, yesterday it was so much better than this. And, you know, I can see, I always get a bit of disappointed when I'm speaking to someone who's a little bit older than me, like yourself, but looks younger because of this ridiculous grey I've got in my beard. So that's always a little bit disappointing. Um, but I, th- I don't want to get into that. But I have had conversations with numerous people about what we're missing from rugby and the culture right now. And the example I give, and, and forgive me if I mention Marist, because that's where my uh, that's where my roots were in Auckland. Your university, eh? is that right? That's correct. Yeah. But um, I've said many times, you know, I'd go to um, oh, what was the name of the park? I was going to say Potter's Park. It's not Potter's Park. It's, anyway, Liston the, Park. Liston right, park. Liston Park, the Marist. And I would literally be like, literally, without exaggeration, two meters away from the world's greatest winger, watching him crash into opposition, and and just speaking, just speaking to him a few minutes ago, actually, on the way home. So. I've been chasing yeah. him for one of these as well, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. But um, but literally be two metres away from him. And then inside him, there'd be another All Black and Bernie McCarthy. And then in the scrum, there'd be the Brook Brothers. And I just, I, I wonder, I, I, it feels like now a, a quality player at 17 will go straight from, you know, whatever college into the development team for the Super Rugby. And that part of rugby seems to be missing. I guess I can't say whether it's better or worse, but I think it's a bit of a shame that, you, you know, a four, yeah, a 14 year old now doesn't see, yeah. uh, doesn't see, yeah. who, who are we going to say? Uh, Adi Savia necessarily three yeah. metres from him on a Saturday uh, early afternoon. Yeah, if you if you think about it this way, and I and I, I, mean, I fully understand what you're saying, Pat, but if you think about it this way, um, you know, when I was playing and in years before me, there was club rugby, and then there was provincial rugby, and then there was test rugby. Yeah, there wasn't another layer called super rugby. Yeah, you know that happened with the advent of professionals at the beginning of 1996. So, so you can't play all the games in, in a year. Yeah. Um, so what happens, and in, in a funny sort of way, it's shifted where Mitre 10 Cups almost become the club rugby four, you know, and even then they don't play too much. They're going to play a bit more year this year, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. But even then they don't they don't play too much because you've got a lot of super rugby and, a, and a, you know, that's when I started playing for the All Blacks, we had seven tests a year. We finished up playing 10 tests a year. Now they have 14 or 15. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's different. Um, 
But, you know, a comparison, well, I didn't have Super Rugby when I was playing. In my last year or two of rugby, I was like if I played one club game. Um, that was just, that was the way it was. We were playing a lot of provincial rugby, 20 provincial games in a year, plus some all-black tests. Yep. Still, you know, maybe 30 first-class games or there, thereabouts. I mean, they're still playing about that number nowadays, maybe a few more. But there's just not room to fit it all in. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, you know, um, while well, we can for the good old days, um, <laughs> and they were, they were good old days. You know, there's a whole go- there's a whole group of modern day players who don't know any different. Yeah, they actually don't know any different. You know, and, and to be perfectly honest, what was acceptable back when we were playing in terms of you know um, um, behaviour and having a few beers and that is just you know we'd get in all sorts of trouble nowadays. You know, but what but what back then it was you know I mean it was just it's, it was what you did. Yep. You didn't know any different. That yep. was the culture. It's moved. Yep. Right. And um, because of this little thing here, I'm just showing it's changed our lives. <laughs> it certainly has. You know, you know that, that you made one step out of line, and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> you're all you're all over the shop. So, I mean, you hear people people who are like the top echelon, highest profile people in the the country and the world saying like from the 80s and 90s, gosh, if there was social media when I was that age, if there was cell phones with cameras when I was that age, I I, I would have been down the same rabbit hole as yeah. some of these people falling from grace today. Correct, but but then again, if it had been there, we would have adapted. Yeah, Because you know you have to. You know, we would have made the adjustments at the time. Um, and look, you also got to understand that these uh, 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 young men um, who make mistakes, um, they do, you know. And um, I mean, sometimes it's just their brain. The other time is that it might be impaired by alcohol, which leads to dumb decisions. Yep. So even with where we are nowadays, we well know. I mean, players still make some dumb decisions occasionally, um, you know, because they're human. They make errors. With that after match function, though, I mean, I remember again talking about the club rugby going up to the club rooms afterwards and everyone having. Uh, not necessarily me because I was a teenager at the time, but a lot of the players and the adults are having, you know, three, four, five jugs on their table. Yeah. And so that yeah. actual culture of alcohol and potentially what could happen with that alcohol was a part of that rugby culture. Whereas now you say yeah. a couple of quiet beers in the dressing room after with the opposition, that seems to be going away from what from what the game is about today. You know, New Zealand's rugby racing beer. Yeah. That, was, that was the old yeah. adage in the 60s yeah. through to the 80s. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that with the rise of technology and the ability to, let's say, catch someone out. Also, you're probably seeing the decrease in the access to things like alcohol associated directly with the game as well. Yeah, the other part of that is also, I mean, it's a profession now, right? It's what they do for a living. Um, and so, um, you know, their bodies, their temple, it's their major asset. Yeah, They've got to look after it. There's a lot of science around it nowadays. So, you know, I mean, there's some guys who choose during the season nowadays not to not to drink at all, or certainly they it's very limited. Don't get me wrong, every now and again, they might have a blowout if they've got a bye weekend. But <laughs> I'm not saying that's right either. But, you know, I mean, people people leave their work office on a Friday night and go and have a blowout, right? And I don't see why rugby players necessarily should be judged any differently Agreed. than that. As long as you don't abuse anyone or break anything, you know, don't drink, drive, all that sort of stuff, then, you know, okay, we all know alcohol can do harm, but yep. everything in moderation and in balance, right? So, um, um, but mate, it's because of what they do for a living. So, yep. you know, a uh, lot more knowledge and a lot more science around, you know, how you need to look after your body. I remember uh, several years ago, decades ago, Charles Barkley came out, but also um, Shane Warne in Australia used to make it very clear, I'm not I'm not here to be a... a you know, don't look up to me and my personality. Yeah. I'm, I'm here to be judged yeah. for my cricket ability. Judge me yeah. in my yeah. cricket. I'm happy for you to put me on some kind of pedestal for my skills on the field, but what I do off the field is, isn't what people should be judging me by. So I think that might be a little yeah. bit black and white naive of him, but but you get it. You know, it's like I'm a, I'm a rugby player. Judge me for my rugby. Yeah, and, and unfortunately there's not a lot of that nowadays because, you know, we make judgments on all sorts of things, don't we? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, <clears throat> these guys are meant to be role models. I also, I get that, but on one hand, I get the I get the mindset that we're just rugby players, right? So, um, you know, let us get on with what we're good at and, and in every other respect, we're, we're normal. We are going to make mistakes like other normal human beings do. Don't expect us to be necessarily, you know, the absolute um, lily white because, you know... We, you know, while we aspire to be that, we're still going to make some mistakes along the way. But because we play this in a public arena, it's judged a little bit differently. I get that. I understand that. But, you know, <clears throat> we also got to practice forgiveness, don't we? Totally. Make a mistake. Don't, don't repeat it again. And, um, again, as long as you don't abuse anyone or hurt anyone or break the law, you know, 
um, you know, we should have some tolerance. Yeah, I mean, it's as you say, it's their job now. If someone was a accountant and they did a similar thing in public, then we shouldn't judge an all black any differently necessarily based I mean you might say yes young people look up to them they don't look up to the accountant but actually when it comes down to the morality or the legality of it they shouldn't really have any yeah. different expectations than the accountant or the dentist or the doctor or the whatever yeah I, I, I understand and I agree with that yeah. I also understand the other side of it that, that because I guess rugby's in a far more public arena um, um, and you know these, these young people who um, you know, um, idolise these guys, put them up on a pedestal. I sort of get the other side of it as well. Yeah. But as in everything, it's just about balance, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, um, I put up yesterday on my Facebook page that you were coming on, and straight away I got two comments. The first was, how could that not have been a try for Grant Fox against Ireland? I've watched it <laughs> numerous times. It was. But then someone else said this, and I want to know first if this is correct, if you know. Yeah. But um, I, I'm going to be able to show you something here on your screen which is my computer, and other people watching yeah. will be able to see it. And someone told me that this was 30 years ago yesterday. The the infamous Carers Brook versus Scotland, this one. Oh, this one. Someone told me that, um, that, that your one test try was 30 years ago yesterday. Do you know if that's right well, or not? Well, I, what I can tell you is that it was my uh, 28th birthday. So so my birthday was yesterday. Oh, there you go. So it might have been might have been yesterday so and I'm 58 now and I was 28 back then so um it just happened to be the 16th of June was a Saturday and this week it was a Tuesday yep um but yeah in theory 30 30 years ago 30 years ago eh and and is there still repercussions between you and Fitzy about him stepping over the line against Ireland <laughs> Mate, every time I'm in his company I don't I don't have to put my hand in the pocket to buy a beer put it that way <laughs> when you when you look back and I mean um as people know who listen to this and watch this, we kind of are more conversational than interviewee. But I always like to look around and do some reading. And whilst I know a lot about your rugby days because Auckland boy, fan at the time, um, looking back at, at your career, you're credited for a bunch of the kicking skills that are still used today. For example, the leaning the ball forward. Is that accurate as well? Were you kind of the first one to start doing that when you were, when you were kicking? Uh, Peter, um, Pat, I don't know the answer to that. Right. I mean... Uh, I, I did that because, um, I mean, technically my process was around the, the spot that I wanted my foot to make contact with on the ball. If I leaned it forward a bit, it opened it up, right? So made it easier to get to that point, easier to sight actually on at the back of the run up. So right. I, could, I could focus on that. It also helped with the particular um, rotational speed I wanted on the ball, right? So it's, a, it's sort of height versus distance power thing, right? Not, I mean, didn't have it didn't have the technology to measure it but that was all part of the thought process right. um, whether I was the first to do it I somehow doubt it right. but um, but it, but it was just it was just the way I set it up and do you still find um, I mean I guess those of us who have kind of of the era of the 80s have had a generation between us and current players or current young people but are there still people today coming to you? Um, talking about your career, like people who are playing that number 10 position, about what you did and how you did it and how it's influenced them. Does that still happen to this day? Oh, look, not, not, not so much. I mean, you know, because of, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have a role with the All Blacks. So I'm around a lot of the, you know, the elite players, you know, often enough. And particularly when we pick an All Black team, I'm around that team a lot. Right. And you know, there will be the odd conversation that we have. But, but to be honest, Pat, I, I'm mostly shy away from that because we have coaches right and, and those conversations need to be had with the coaches because not my job so I'm very clear on, on where my you know the line in the sand for me and if a player wants to have a conversation often I'll ask for permission for from a from one of the coaches or if it's a short one I'll download to the coaches what happened so they know they need to know right so again my role is very strongly at the elite level selecting yep uh, not coaching right so very clear on what my role is um uh, but, you know, I mean, on occasion, you know, I mean, I've had conversations in the back of the bus with DC, with yeah. Odin, yeah. you know, with Crudes, he was playing, um, you know, that that sort of thing. They're not deep and meaningful, but, you know, they might be in passing, or, or Naren Smith might might have got not so much nowadays because he's become a very good kicker. But when he first got picked, you know, sort of kicking skills and that sort of thing. So that happened on, on occasion. But, you know, we have specialist uh, kicking coaches who are very, very good at what they do. So, um, you know, they, they don't need me you know, interfering and giving another message. How did you feel, I guess, as an ex-Auckland player, and I'm assuming still Auckland fan, about 
securing both Bowden Barrett and DC for this uh, Super Rugby Aotearoa competition? Look, I mean, I mean, if, if I'm really honest, Auckland's where my real heart is because I never played for the Blues, right? right. Um, and while I'm a, I'm a fan of the Blues, obviously because it's where I live, you know, when it comes to watching watching games, I only see black, um, and and I see because we're looking at players, doesn't matter where they come from, um, and and the first thing we think of is we don't want injuries because particularly with players we're looking at. Um, so that, you know, that's where I, I come on. But in terms of the guys they've secured, I mean, you know, f- for years, I mean, they talk about we haven't had one since Carlos Spencer. Well, I think we forget we had Eason Afewa after Carlos, mm. uh, who was very 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 good rugby player and did a fine job at ten before he went overseas. And they have struggled to fill since then, no doubt. Um, and um, and in Auckland, you would think that we should be able to, you know, at least generate somebody. And sadly, we've struggled in that area. Mm-hmm. It's not been for one of trying for the franchise, Pat. I mean, they've got, you know, I mean, it's pretty well documented that they, they've tried to get Daniel before when he'd been living in Auckland for a while, although he was playing, obviously, um, um, down for the Crusaders. You know, they tried to get Bowden, they tried to get Cruz, they tried to get Damien McKenzie. It hadn't been for one of trying and, you know, for whatever reasons, and there's probably um, very good ones, those players have chosen not to come. Yeah. Finally, they hooked one in Bodie. You know, they hooked one and now DC at the end of his career has answered a, a call a call for help, yeah. which is which is remarkable, really, and good on him. Do you think there's still that stigma about Auckland? Do you think that maybe, you know, guys from Waikato and from Canterbury and these players that you, the, some of the names you just mentioned about trying to secure, they're like, oh, no, I don't want to play for those guys. I don't want to play for Auckland. But maybe maybe, maybe Bowden's broken that a little bit? Yeah, well, look, was there part of, that, part of that mindset in it? Possibly. But this is also a profession now. So you go where the opportunity lies, don't you? Yeah. Um, and maybe Bodie was looking for a new challenge. You know, um, has, has also, you know, he's married now, his wife's from Auckland. I mean, there are probably a whole lot of factors, um, you know, um, in, in that in that decision for him. Um, but, you know, um, and look, living in the big smoke's not the easiest. You know, that's part of it. I mean, I'll tell you a little bit of a, t- a tidbit of something Ian Foster told me a while back. Um, and this is mainly factual, but not exclusively mm-hmm. factual. But normally a franchise sports team in the biggest city in any country fails. Right, and and, and Fozzie told me that years ago, um, and it's not it's not always the case, but if you if you trace it, it's actually reasonably accurate. And part of that is there's two parts to that. One is that players who don't come from the, the big city, they don't want to deal with the hassle of living in the big city, the congestion, the time it takes, the cost of living, right. cost of buying houses, all sorts of factors are in that. Because when you when you're not used to sitting in and out, going to work and taking an hour to get get to work, um, and you're used to ten minutes down the road, boy, that's that's very different. I'm used to it. it's what I do every day. Yep. Um, um, the other the other part of that is that they're also because there's always a big talent pool in the big city because the sheer number of players playing, they also become a net, net exporter of talent. So they're not exclusively the domain of the people in the big city. You know, there are other and other codes are in the backyard looking at the best talent. Yeah. Because there's lots of other codes, sporting professional codes as well. So that's all just goes. That's all part of the tapestry of of trying to run a sports franchise in, in the biggest city. And uh, not not you know not always easy. They're often a net exporter of talent, not a net importer. Because the thought is the big talent base. Why do you need to import? Well, yeah, yeah. if you want the best, the best is not exclusively. In the big city, is it? We we know that, and often some of our greatest players have come from small places. Yeah. You know, um, Holland Meads from Tikawiti, uh, Daniel Carter from um, um, South Bridge, is it? Um, um, Richie McCall from Kurau. You know, um, they often come from small places. Do you think that um, you mentioned other codes? Do you think that Auckland rugby has been impacted potentially by the Warriors being there as well? Like some of the talent in days gone by that might have flicked over to the rugby because of the uh, you know the um, ability to play for the Warriors. Now that could be an impact on Auckland rugby as well. Yeah, and it's yes, and it's bigger than that. It's the NRL too, right? So it's a whole NRL. Lots of players go straight to other NRL teams, you know. Um, so yes, but uh, but uh, but in all honesty, Pat, I think that's healthy. You know, what a great opportunity for the athletes. Mm. You know, um, um, who come out of school, maybe not sure what they're going to do. Maybe now have a dream of being a professional sports person. Look at the opportunity available for them now. Yep. Um, and, and that's wonderful for the athletes and their families. You know, um, that 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 opportunity is there. And look, from an uh, from uh, you know an Auckland point of view, for me, I would love nothing more than the Warriors and the Blues to be humming. Yeah. Because <laughs> the city of 
vibrant about it. I mean, I, I don't see competition. I really don't. I know lots of people do. I don't see that at all. I just see, you know, a uh, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the league, a great game. We've got a, bloody, we've got a, a team in Auckland called the Warriors. We desperately want them to succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want the Blues to succeed along at, at the same time. And that, boy, boy, we would be really humming in Auckland in the winter if, 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 if that could happen. And then if you throw in there like the Breakers as well, they could be a trifecta of professionals. Well, they've done well. I mean, they, they, you know, they win, don't they? I mean, not <laughs> yeah, last yeah. year. They're rebuilding again, but they've done well. And, you know, look how well the Phoenix have done this year. So um, there's, some, there's, some good, there's some good sporting stories out there at the moment. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of those things. Um, I wanted to n- know from you, because rugby has changed so much and you are talking about science, etc. earlier, and, and I think about people like maybe Inga Tuigamalo was one of the first people that brought sort of an unusual uh, uh, size to a position. Then, you, of course, you see the Jonas and those coming through. Someone like Terry Wright, who was legendary wing, I love to watch him, would he still be able to play because of because of his size primarily, to the same uh, level if he was playing today? Um, or do you think that the physicality of rugby has changed so much that maybe there's not a place in an all-black squad for someone with that physique? Not him and his skill set. I don't want to make it personal about him, but yeah, that, that physique. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, well, the answer is yes, because he wouldn't play it the way he played it. He'd play heavier because he'd, you know, he'd be on a diet, right. a proper diet. He'd be in the weight room, you know. He'd train accordingly. I mean, look, I, I, I'm sure that I would have played heavier. Um, you know, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe only three or four kilos, maybe half a dozen kilos heavier than I played. But I'm sure that had I been around in this era, that would have happened to me too. Mm-hmm. So the, in my humble opinion, the answer is yes. Um, I mean, if, and if you, if you, if you compare um, eras... And I don't. I think it's a, it, it's it's folly to do that because yep. great players in yesterday would be great players today with all the all the modern stuff that goes around today with technology and science and the way they train and eat. Now they'd be still great players today because because great players are great players no matter what era. Yeah. Right? Um, but would today's team beat yesterday's team? Hell yes. Yeah. If the guys <laughs> played like they did yesterday and we played today with the athletes. Well, of course they would. Yeah. But that's not the right comparison. You got to say how good were they were in the era. But they played it, and that's the only measurement that, in my view, is the proper measurement. Um, but Terry would be heavier. But you know, you look at prop, you look at the props now. I mean, God, uh, props in the old days weighed 100 kilos. We might have been lucky, maybe just over. Now these boys, are, these big boys, are in their mid 120s, 130s. You know, they are large lumps. So, I often say to people when I have a discussion about the game, the skills involved in the game haven't changed. Kick, run, pass, tackle, no particular order. Don't don't read in the fact I said kick first, but. <laughs> the skills involved and, and the object of the game, what you're trying to achieve, is still the same. Yeah. But the structure of the game is very different and the athletes are very different. Right. But 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 the aims and objectives are still the same um, and the skill sets involved are still the same. I, I think um, there's a lot of conversation going around the world with various sports about the GOAT at the moment. And I think thanks to The Last Dance, the Michael jo- uh, Jordan documentary mm-hmm. on Netflix, I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. But one I of, did. I watched it. But one of the points that's being made by a lot of commentators is, you know, as you're saying, comparing eras, because in the era of Jordan, there was a lot more physicality in the game than the era today. So they're saying, you know, LeBron or Michael. And it's like, because yeah. it was almost a different, it wasn't a different game, as you say. The, the the basics are the same, but you know you can't touch players today in the NBA. Yeah. You could smash them in that age. So yeah. so yeah, it's very difficult to know who would be the better player if everyone played by the same rules. You just yeah, can't do it. I agree, but you know it's a great barroom conversation and yeah. it's great for the, it's <laughs> media. It's it's column inches and and um, air air time and whatever for the media as well. Um, I mean, I I think those judgments around goat stuff is is, is again folly, but. I also get why the conversations happen. You know, over a few beers in a bar, you know, um, uh, it's a great talking point, as I said, and a great talking point in the media sometimes. And after the Jordan thing, yep. which I absolutely loved. It was great, to eh? To be honest, I, 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 God, man, that guy was driven. <laughs> uh, but some of the fallout afterwards, I'm sitting here thinking, guys, you, if you haven't played at that level, you don't get it. You know, they thought he bullied players and, and all of that. And, and, they're just trying to compare the era. They're trying to say what happened back then should apply now. It's a different era. We yeah. were talking about that before. Um, and and uh, almost all the players admit it. Jordan dragged them up. You know, he dragged them up with him. And yeah, maybe you could argue with the methodology and the way he went about it. But mo- most of them, to a man, said, I was better because of it. They might not have liked his methods, but they said, God, he made me better. And look, he, he won, they won six and eight years. Yep. I think, I think that says it all, doesn't it? 
Yeah, well, I think you can actually say they won six in a row because the only year that he was playing, they didn't win. He only played for a couple of yeah. months. So <laughs> ac- ac- actually, when he played full seasons, they won six in a row. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and I, I think about that as well. I think about, I was a huge basketball fan, still am, and followed it all through. That. That's my era, is the kind of late 80s through late 90s. So loved watching that doco. Well, I, I, loved, I loved where he drew his motivation from because he made it personal. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I was sitting at home... Um, my wife and I watch watching it, and on one of the programs, she said, "What do you think drives him?" I said, "It's personal. Yeah, it's personal." And the funny thing is, about five minutes later, I'm not trying to take any credit for this. Five minutes later, he mentioned that. Yeah, all you got to do is slight him, or even make the slight up. Yeah. Look out. <laughs> yes, but 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 I love the fact that he turned up all the time, and 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 rugby. I saw that in Richie McCall. Right. You know, he's about about. You know, that's the hardest thing I reckon to do. It's doesn't matter what level of sport you play. I reckon that's the hardest thing to do, mentally turn up all the time. Because we don't turn up to work every day at 100%. Mm, we don't. Yeah. You know, some days we're better than others. I mean, that's just the real. It's, but people who play sport are no different. But McCall was the one I saw up in the, in the time I was, you know, fortunate enough to be at the All Blacks. Man, this man just turned up. Unbelievable, you know. Um, man, and, you know, I can – I mean, well – you know, the All Blacks mightn't play great every test in a row, and we're striving to do that, but it's clear we don't. Yeah. Because um, that's the hardest thing to do. Um, I, I reckon I reckon McCaw, I mean, it's hard to think that he didn't turn up all the time. Man, oh, man, he was just in- incredible. And, that, and that, I just, okay, I thought that with Jordan. He just, he turned up every time, didn't he? Well, I, he was a, he had an attitude, Jordan did, that there might be someone watching me for the first time. That was one of the things that drove him. And he was like, if someone is watching me for the first time, I want to put a show on for them. And with the Richie yeah. McCall one, I think for those of us that maybe haven't you know, been on the inner circle and, and experienced it from inside, I think that kind of realisation came to me, uh, Was it, it was 2011, wasn't it? 2011 Rugby World Cup, yeah. when he was having to get his heels screwed back on, basically, yeah. to play the game, and they weren't telling anyone. And it just reminded me of the Jordan, you know, there's the famous Jordan flu um, finals yeah. game where we had, had food poisoning yeah. and food poisoning, no, yeah. nobody knew and nobody knew till afterwards and it was like the reason he wasn't at practice or wasn't seen in public was because he couldn't kind of walk during the week yeah. and he was playing yeah. in the weekends and that that was the moment I went okay this guy's a you know it's those it's those yeah. stories like Colin Meads playing with a broken arm or or a buck shelf and having a ripped testicle or you know whatever yeah. it is yeah. that's the thing that you kind of you, you, you use the phrase turning up those are the things that yeah. you go this, this person's unstoppable there's nothing you can do yeah. Mm. Yeah, he was incredible. I lo- I absolutely loved that that series. You know, we just we binge watched it. Yeah. The moment it was on, we we watched whatever was available that time. We just watched it. That was obviously during lockdown, so it was it was a great opportunity to do those sorts of things. How was lockdown for you guys? How was for you for you and your whanau? You know, um, I got a taste of retirement, Pat, <laughs> um, I, and I quite liked it to be perfectly honest. I wasn't sure how I'd cope, but. You know, um, I live in a place called Beechins in Auckland, which is a little coastal settlement, so it's a little bit out of the big smoke. Um, you know, we've got a little bit of land here, just under an acre, and, you know, we've been here 25 years, and we've got quite mature gardens, and my wife and I got absolutely stuck into it. The weather was great. Yep. Um, we really enjoyed that, and I've got a, uh, my, my, our daughter and her husband and their little one, um, who's coming up too, lives just down the road. And um, and we saw them every day. And, um, you know, nice news. Our daughter, um, we found out just before like then our daughter's pregnant with number two. Nice. Congratulations. Uh, she was suffering terrible morning sickness. So it was like, well, you know, um, and, and her husband um, needed to work at home with the business he's got. He was spending a lot of time on the computer and the telephone. So I was like, well, chuck little Lincoln up our way. Yep. You know, we'll take them from nine to, uh, nine to 12 every day. You can, you know, either rest up or do what you want to. So, so we had him you know, five days away, it was an absolute joy, you know, so it was, you know, we had a business that was suffering terribly, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I mean, I loved it. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, it, it seems that a lot of people, maybe not, I, I don't know if I use the word retirement, but a lot of people found, like, value in that. For me personally, I um, I did, like, 25 podcasts in, like, 30 days yeah. because yes. e- everyone was at home do- and I instigated yeah. this Zoom thing. Everyone was at home yes. and everyone was chatting. And so I was run off my feet but loved it, loved to be able yes. to do the work and loved to be able to get into it. And I built a yeah. studio in my house. So, you know, I was I was, yeah. I was was busy. So, yeah. Yeah, you busy. I mean, the funny thing is, I, I mean, I actually lost some weight during lockdown, which is contrary to what a lot of people do. <laughs> we just ate really healthy because you couldn't, you know, it was, we, we live close to a supermarket, but we just, you know, we couldn't be bothered going up and queuing every day and that. So we just sort of cope with what was in the cupboard or the fridge and, 
get their portion sizes down. So that was the, and we didn't do much baking. That was the irony for us. We just thought, oh, this is not, I'm in, I'm in a notch on the belt. I was quite happy. Um, coming out of the lockdown, and obviously one of the things that New Zealand has done as a celebration is Super Rugby Aotearoa. I heard TJ yeah. saying on uh, Sunday's game, it was the Auckland game, quite yeah. close towards the end. I'm paraphrasing, I'm not going to get the quote right, but it was something like, you know, 43,000 people at Eden Park. This is not um, this is not just a game of rugby. It's a celebration of something amazing New Zealand has achieved, meaning we were able yeah. to actually get 43,000 people back because of what we've done. Were yeah. you were you at Eden Park on Sunday? I was. Yeah. And what I was, was. T- give us a give us a you know what was it like? What was the vibe? Uh, I mean, I mean, look, any venue when it's near full or full has got a vibe about it. Um, and it, and no doubt Eden Park had that. I mean, it was. I mean, I agree with TJ. I think it was partly a celebration of, um, you know, um, uh, getting out of lockdown. Um, although we'd been out of it for a little while, it was some people just saying. Um, you know, it was a, we hadn't we've missed rugby. We yeah. want to go along. It was an afternoon game. Yeah. Uh, um, 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 I, I don't know. There was a, you know a lot of people went for the first time. It was a multitude of things, and you know the, the, the interesting thing will be whether it can be repeated. And I don't think they'll get a full house again. Um, and I, if I'm brutally honest, I didn't think they'd get a full house this time. So, well done for the people who you know people who supported it, but the people who are also behind it. You know, yeah. helping market it and drive it, uh, the Blues and Eden Park. Um, especially, I guess, in that regard. But um, um, where am I going with this? I'm losing my train of thought. I'm getting getting old and a bit dottery. But um, I mean, so the Blues are they got a game this week against the Chiefs. If they happen to to win that, they got the Highlanders the following week. I think that's right. You know, if they got another, if they got thirty thousand back to Eden Park, that'd be a massive achievement. Yeah. You know, I'm sort of hoping in a way this might be, you know, a little sign of things things to come. Bear in mind, we're local derbies too, and they've always been the biggest game. Absolutely, and they're Exclusively local derbies on a home and away basis. So um, it's tough on the players because you're going to be brutal uh, <laughs> physically. But, um, but yeah, I think the fans love the derby. So, um, yeah, good start. Be nice to see it continue, you know, to, to a level that's close to that. Do you think that the best rugby in the world, the best quality of rugby in the world, is New Zealand super rugby teams playing New Zealand super rugby teams? Um, look... I'm going to look through one eye and say, yeah, I, I, I believe it. I believe it is. But you've also got to consider we play it when we start. It's in February. Mm-hmm. We play it in, 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 in months where there's a re- where there's really good weather. Um, you know, um, you know. I think we've. I, I mean, I think we one of our advantages in New Zealand. We got the best coaches in the world. Yeah. You know, not not every individual's better than everyone else, but collectively, I think one of the great strengths of our game is the quality of our coach, and that's not just at the elite level either. I really think it's an advantage we have. And you've only got to witness how many guys we've got around the world coaching. For sure. At a high level. That tells you that, that we've got coaches in demand. Um, so, you know, that, so, and we've got a mindset towards the game in terms of how we want to play it. You know, we've got a lot of, a lot of very gifted athletes who, you know, is almost their DNA is built to play this game, this mm-hmm. more play contact sport. So um, you put all those things together, you know, I would, you know, I would, say yes but you know I'm biased of course others in other jurisdictions and we shouldn't belittle that would have, have different points of view but they also play you know if you want to talk about what goes on up north they largely play in different conditions Yeah, yeah. so it's not always easy for them to play the style of game and you know sometimes the way they want to play the game from a mindset point of view is a little bit different than us too so you know um, but we know what happens when we bring the best of the best together and play at international level and often you get, you know, you get a hell of a contest, and we don't always get what we want, and we don't have to go too far back to, to remind us of that. So, if we're getting kind of the best, let's say the best club rugby in the world at the moment, um, is there is this a is this the time to be having the conversation about how to monetize a, a New Zealand an exclusive New Zealand competition similar to the NRL? A few extra teams in there, making it a bit bigger, and having a New Zealand professional competition to then take that to the world like Australia's done with rugby league to the world. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the rugby league is survives very well as, as a larger club based competition, and yeah, they have state of Ireland and the international program is nowhere near as big as rugby. Yeah, and it, it's not as big a footprint, um, I guess, in many ways as rugby, and that's not trying to be little rugby league at all. It's just it's it's it, it's different. And it's come from different roots. Look, I don't know the real answer to that question. I would have, I would give you a scattergun sort of top of the mind view of it. 
because it's not something I've thought deeply about, Pat, to be perfectly honest. But yep. um, whether we like it or not, the game's pro. You know, it needs to be able to generate money. Um, if we want to keep the best athletes in our backyard playing, given the competition we've got, some, uh, uh, got from up north from bigger markets with deeper pockets, mm -hmm. we need to be really careful about this. Because if we, if we don't get this right and we can't play our players as much, more of them will play offshore. And then the, the competition's not as good. When the competition's not as good, the All Black team's not going to be as good. Yeah. Uh, and and you know um, whether we like it or not, um, probably the biggest single so biggest single revenue source for the game is Sky TV in New Zealand. They would probably pay the biggest chunk of revenue. Yep. So um, you know and and you know they run a business. So there's a delicate balance here that exists between you know, what, what are the needs of the broadcaster and the needs of the game, and hopefully they can happily coexist, and, and, and I'm reasonably confident that that's always been always been the aim. Um, but if you, I want to just bring one example about more teams. Um, I don't think five extra teams have served Australia that well, personally. Yeah, yeah right. Um, I think it's, it's spread the talent out more. Therefore, the, the teams aren't as competitive, with rare exceptions when the Reds win it or the the Waratahs have won it. They ha in more recent times, they haven't been as competitive. I don't think that served the Wallabies well. It might have actually taken the game more broadly around Australia, but has it served well at a higher level? Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you take New Zealand from five teams and put it into eight teams, you spread the talent even more. Um, and then, and then I'm going to throw this other one. If we don't play, you know, playing against South African teams on a regular basis in the last 25 years has actually helped us be able to compete with the Springboks an awful lot more than we have traditionally were able to before the game was pro. Right. Um, you know, their their win-loss record against us was, was reasonably significantly in their favour until professional rugby came along. And when it came along, um, we balanced the ledger and got ahead of them. And part of that is playing them on a regular basis, not just not just at test level. Um, but, you know, would, would there be enough money existing if we was a trans-Tasman competition I don't know the answer to that, possibly. I understand, apart from derby games, and I wouldn't have believed this, but I got told the other day this to be the case, that the TV ratings, while the derby games are the biggest, the next biggest are when we play Aussie teams. When we play South African teams, they don't rate as highly. I wouldn't have thought that because I've got a real interest when we play the Sharks or the Stormers, you know, um, perhaps more so than some of the Australian teams. So, you know, somewhere in all of that waffle, <laughs> People can draw their own conclusions and, and come up with their own uh, their own ideas, but I don't. I mean, whatever you do, I don't think it's necessarily as simple as saying afternoon games, more teams here, trans Tasman, <laughs> will get the outcome we want. Because if it, we if it, if it weakens the competition and we don't get enough broadcast money and can't keep our best players, but spreading the players around too much, you know, means that it can actually weaken the All Blacks. Because yep. we've seen that in Australia, in my view, then. Um, I'm not necessarily that believing that's the right outcome. But maybe somewhere in all of that, people who are smarter than me who think about this more often than I do, because I don't think about it very often, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, they, they will have better solutions than I've just... And I haven't come up with a solution. I've probably thrown up some obstacles that people just need to think through properly. I wonder if there's also quite a simple... Um reason that the Super Rugby games against South Africans are the are the least watched and it might be just the time frame I mean I don't think I've ever really watched a live game Super Rugby game from South Africa because it's one or two in the morning in the middle of the night I'm, yeah. I'm more talking about games played in New Zealand right, right okay, so gotcha, even the gotcha. South African games played in New Zealand as I understand oh, okay. on average the Aussie teams when we play Aussie teams Aussie teams rate higher Wow. So I'm not talking about the middle of the night I get the middle of the night but there's not going to be as many people so when the Sharks um, are playing the Chiefs in Hamilton yeah, yeah, gotcha. it's that, it's that, from from what, I, and I wouldn't have thought that, right? Because my particular interest is more, like, well, you know, God, when you're playing the Sharks or the Stormers or the Bulls when they were good, hell, that's a hell of a contest. We were probably beating the Aussie teams more often than we were beating. Remember, we were in about 25 straight or something beating Aussie yeah. teams. But we didn't do that against South African teams. Yeah, but true. Apparently, the audience audience sits a bit differently. So, anyway. I wonder if that, <laughs> a bit of a long bow here, but demonstrates a bit more fickleness of the audience. They like to see their teams win rather than not. I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Well, yeah, and, and maybe, maybe it's about, the, about how much content we got. We all understand that the saying less is more. Yep. But, you know, when, when we talk about less is more, when, you know, will you still get the same money generated for the game if we've got less content? Well, um, and they, there again is your delicate balance because if you've got less content, and someone pays less money, we've got less to pay players. Yep. Therefore, it gets harder to keep our best players. Yep. Um, but but if left if left if less brings 
a net gain in audience, then, you know, that might be the right answer. But uh, have we got the courage to try that? I mean, you hear the arguments all the time about you cheapen the ticket prices, we'll get bigger crowds. Well, you know, <clears throat> I've spoken to a lot of marketing managers of rugby unions and franchises over the years. And, and if, that, if that was really true, um, they would have done that by now. And because you, you know, yeah. in business, you talk yield, you talk yield. So if, if you sell them for less and you don't get the, the, enough uplift and your yield's different from a smaller crowd, but um, higher ticket prices when you're running a business, there is your, you know, there's your delicate balance in it. And while bigger crowds are better, we get all that, you're still running a business. And I think so, I think that well, does come back to the quality of the business and the content as well. I think I heard Eddie Jones on the break the breakdown, I think it is on Sky Sport the other yeah. day, saying when they played England and when the All Blacks played England uh, in Twickenham, they literally had enough, um, you know, pre-subscribes to sell it four times over, so they could have charged yeah. anything they wanted and and filled it because it was about the content, it was about the, you know, the quality of the game they were going to see. So, and I was yeah. just I was just thinking yeah. again about the NRL. I mean, and from yeah. my opinion, the three greatest the three greatest games of rugby league every year. Uh, the state of origin, you know, they're the three games. The less is more. If I if I'm if I'm if I'm busy and I'm not watching a lot of league and, and league is not my first choice. I do enjoy it, but I I won't miss a state of origin. I just won't. They're the three greatest games. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I I don't watch a lot of league um, um, because I have to a lot of, watch a lot of rugby, so I end up watching a lot of league. I wouldn't be very popular at home. <laughs> um, um, and and if, if state of origin was on earlier. Uh, I would certainly w- watch it live because it's on, you know, l- later at night over here, I'll often go to bed. But in the morning, I'm trying to find the result. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a Maroons fan when it comes to that. <laughs> so I'm always keen for the blimmin', you know, the boys up north to win that. Um, but but they're, they're great. Kind of, I love the intensity of the contest. And, and I'd argue in many ways, it's, it's it, I don't know, is it is it of more interest in the international game? I don't know, maybe. I think it, I think I mean I think Brad Thorne's an example, isn't it? He basically wanted to play for Queensland, and that means he couldn't play for the Kiwis, and that was the choice he made. So he yep. wanted he he picked yep. he picked the maroon jersey over the black jersey. Yep. That shows how important yep. it is to at least some of the players there. And I have been wondering actually for a long time is there a, is there a place for that in New Zealand in the rugby scene, like a state of origin? Yep. And I was thinking, you know, we've obviously obviously got North Island, South Island, but maybe. Maybe their their state of origin is where they first had a representative team. We have a lot of players coming in from the islands who couldn't do like a high school team, but maybe they first played for um, the Highlanders. Yeah. So that yeah. would be their state, and then, and then and then you know Aaron Smith first played for Manawa too. So that would be his state. He'd be a North Island player, and I I don't know I don't know maybe maybe yeah. there's something real special about that rugby league that wouldn't translate. But it has been something I've, yeah. I've wondered about for a while. Yeah, look, um, you're probably going to see you're going to see that this year. There is going to be a North South game this year. Cool. Right? Uh, we haven't had one for a long time. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, can you could you run a series of those of three of them during the year? No, you couldn't. There's nowhere in the schedule to fit it in. It's, right. it's almost impossible to fit one in. Um, you, you know, um, but the eligibility becomes really interesting because um, how do you do that? Do you do it where they went, to, where they were born, where they went to school, where they first played club rugby, where they first played? Provincial rugby, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't go as far as where they first played, um, where they first played um, Super Rugby, right? Um, I'd go where they first played Provincial Rugby. Yeah, that would, I, would, would, yeah. That would seem to be the easiest one to do. You also want the best players playing, don't you? Because if you get that criteria wrong, you could have a whole lot of guys who are technically international stars who mm-hmm. wouldn't play that game because they might all be loaded up towards one of the islands in particular. So. You know, it's, 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 I mean, we've been going through that exercise from an All Black selection point of view, right? Just having a look at what does that look like, because you know there is going to be a North South game this year. Uh, it is, but it's an interesting exercise to dive through. I tell you, to go through. And if you did that, I mean, I'm I'm intrigued now because you've just said that you guys are currently talking about it. If you did do that, um, provincial. The first provincial team, like for example, yeah. LeBron James is a good example. You know, when when NBA players get introduced, it says what college they're from. He didn't go to college, so yeah. it says it's high yeah. school. If you did club teams, but let's say we had a player yeah. from Fiji who didn't play for a club team, but they played for a uh, for a Super Rugby team, then that they'd be played in there. But if they went through the club system, the club team could be their their state. Yeah. And I do wonder I as well if you if you get the club team as the selection, yeah. that will give that person some. 
um, that will ground them a little bit. I'm sure Aaron yeah. Aaron Smith ha- is quite passionate about Manawatu. It was where he was brought up. It was where he went yeah. to high school. Yeah. So, so yeah. representing that, I still think would be so, something so worth. You, are you many, so you're mentioning Manawatu and club in the same team. So you're just you're saying Manawatu's the, the club team. Yeah, I guess I'm saying that, that's uh, the pre- provincial not the, team. Not the, not the club team within Manawatu, but Manawatu. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, the yeah. province, right? Yeah, so the just province. for clarity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, on that basis, so we were really clear about this too that we didn't want. Um, players who play in New Zealand of a different, uh, who are born elsewhere, i.e. the Pacific Islands, um, 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 unfairly, well, not being able to be selected, right? If yeah. we, if, if they were deemed good enough, right? So that was part of what's been looked at too, because it would be unfair to say, well, you're just not eligible. So that's all been part of this game. I'm not going to download the criteria, but we've come up with a criteria and, and I'm not going to say where certain players are from, but it will surprise some people where certain players first played based on the criteria that we think that they'll, the North South, it hasn't been finally decided yet right? because it's not just about the group of all black selectors thinking that's the criteria. There are other people involved. We have a view. Yes. Um, but there are other people involved in, in, in coming up with a criteria. They'll either going to agree with us or disagree with us. And somewhere along the line, we'll either agree to disagree and commit perhaps um, and get on with it. But it, it, it'll be very interesting when, when that comes to fruition and the teams are selected. I didn't realise that guy first played his rugby there because he's playing right. somewhere else now. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, not to mention his name three times, but Aaron Smith's a perfect example. Speak to most people, they think he's Otago through and through. I mean, it was a bit like when mm. Saki was playing. Why Saki? I mean, he's from Taranaki. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so it would be, it's kind of, sure. I think it'd be kind of cool. So yeah. it sounds like what you're saying is you guys have an idea that's not quite yeah, finalised, but, but you're not... And I'll give you a hand. It won't be based on where they play Super Rugby or where they first played Super Rugby. Cool. Right? Well, what if... You've got two teams in the South Island and three in the North, right? Yeah. So automatically you've got an imbalance. Okay. What, what happens if Super Rugby is the only rugby they've played in New Zealand? Like if a player has come from, let's say, the islands and they never play look, provincial? Based on what we've been through, right, based on what we've been through, yep. um, I don't think that's an issue. Okay. Right? I don't think that's an issue. Based on, on, on you know, a little shadow look, we've had a look at this. Yeah. How does this stack up? I can't recall that there's been any issues in that regard. Is it uh, no, when you when you have the sh- when you have the shadow lock? Does that look like an exciting game, an evenly matched hell up yes. sort of game? Hell yes, <laughs> hell yes. I mean, one area might have a slight advantage in the forwards on paper, and the other <laughs> area might have a slight advantage in the backs on paper, right? But it looks, you know, when you've got some quality players playing, hell yes. And, and can we confirm now that this game will get bought to Forsyth Bar? And get played in Dunedin? Is that can we put that out there at all? Uh, I've got a fair idea where it's going to be played, but I'll neither confirm it or not. Hey, um, just speaking about the selection criteria, because you're an all black selector, I've always wondered. I understand, you know, if you're playing in England, you're not going to get selected for the All Blacks. But I've never quite understood if you're playing for Queensland in the Super Rugby franchise. Right why you can't get selected for the All Blacks, because we're playing them every week. It's the same competition. What's now the rationale behind that? I know the answer. But I mean, look, if you go back to the original rationale, I'm going to argue on the basis of how how well we've done. It's been it's been a good policy for us um, because um, to, it started with to play for the All Blacks, you've got to play in one of our teams in our backyard, right? right? And the pull of the All Black jersey meant that, that if you get an offer to go overseas, you might think twice about it, knowing that we can't compete with the money, right? Yep. So that's the ball. So it helps keep the best players, not only, I mean, so the best players could be playing offshore, right? But they're not eligible, or some of the best players. But playing in our backyard, that means they're playing for the Crusaders and the Highlanders and the Hurricanes and the Chiefs and the Blues. Otherwise, you're not going to have our best players, and the fans aren't going to like that either. They want our best players in the other competitions in our backyard, not just playing for the All Blacks. So I think, I think that's been that's been a great thing for us. It's easier to judge from a selection point of view when they're also playing in our backyard. Yeah. Um, perhaps if they're playing offshore, boy, I think that's. I'm not sure that picking from offshore strengths and us because they're playing in a different competition, different style of game. How do we judge that? You know, they got to travel in late. Often, all of those things are factors. Their season's also different. They're playing in a, a different season. Um, so um, the next step will be, if we are ever to change the eligibility, would be in our competition. Yeah, so... Like if we're playing for a South African team, if it's still... A South African's still here. Or, in, 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 in a super competition. So right? Yeah, so, so they're playing for the Rebels out of Melbourne. So they are in our that. competition. Uh, look, that, 
there's been discussions with that over the years. It hasn't transpired. But if it ever, if it is ever to change, that'll be the first change that's made. Right. Right. Um, but, but, but bear in mind, when we can't compete money-wise, and bear in mind, these guys do this for a pro- profession and, and uh, for a living, and some of the money that's on offer overseas will set these guys up for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the pull of the all black jersey, we, you know, when you can't compete for the money, you've got to put that in, into the frame somewhere. And I'd argue, given the success we've had, it's worked because I'll, I'll tell you a fear I had when the game went pro. I thought, oh my God, how are we going to compete? We don't have as many players playing, we don't have the money, yeah. we don't have the resources. Well, actually, it turned out we did have the resources it's called talent. Yeah, <laughs> you might not have many, but it's called talent. And the other thing I mentioned um, is boy, we got some good coaches. And it's turned out under the professional era, we've got a better win-loss record in the professional era than we had in the amateur era. Um, and we play more test matches. Um, and yes, we play some of the so-called lesser lights, but we also play some of the big boys every year, several times a year. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a, that's a balancing act. So we've done, a, in my view, for a little old country, you know, a pimple on the world's ass at the, at the back end of the world, we've done pretty well. Um so we don't want to take that advantage away. And the selection criteria we have, in my, my humble opinion, is one of our advantages amongst the others I've mentioned. Indeed. Um, Matt's watching us on Facebook at the moment, wants to know uh, your feelings about the lack of rucking in the modern game. And would you ever consider well, returning to funny. it? Yeah, right. I, I'm not that, I don't read the law book as closely as I used to. But my understanding is you're still allowed to ruck. Yeah. I, and I've had this discussion with their friends and they, and they say, you're still allowed to. I say, yeah, but you don't let us. Right, the moment you, you put your, your boot on someone, even if it's the right ruck in motion, they will blim and they will um, they'll pin you. So my understanding is you're still allowed to ruck, but that's not how it's refed. Nice. Um, and so players lie all over the bloody place now because they know there's no consequences. And you should have seen Buck Shelford back after a, yeah. after a rugby <laughs> test match. Boy, yeah. you know, blim and series of crossroads all over the shop. Um, and, uh, and others, and on the very occasion, I used to get one of my reds and wear it like a badge of honour, but yep. I didn't get in rucks very often. Um, and when I did, I got chased, but that's okay. Um, um, so um, the answer is you, you're allowed to do it. It's not ref that way. Right. They're trying to clean it up now, if you look at it. So you, you still won't be allowed to ruck. They're trying to tidy the breakdown up now. And so we haven't actually had really a change of, of rules. We're just, we're, just, we're just interpreting it differently, more like it was set out to be interpreted. It will take a period of adjustment. But when we get it right, um, boy, we're going to have we, the product's going to get quicker, and it's already quick enough now. Well, so. there, there was very few scrums in the weekend, wasn't there? But there was quite a lot of there was quite a lot of whistle and penalties. That's probably something they're going to need to tweak. Yeah, well, I'm not sure the players need to adjust. Yeah, right, right. Players, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm not looking at referees here. Um, I'm looking at players. They need to adjust, and they will. Right, and the, you know the way they coached and that they just they just. There's some old habits there, and they're testing some boundaries, mm. and it'll settle. I mean, in, in, in the, the game on Saturday, and Dunedin, 25 minutes before the first scrum, right? Um, the game on Sunday was actually five minutes in, right? right? Um, so, a little bit different in that regard. But in between the penalties, there was a hell of a lot of good rugby. Yes. So if we can get the penalty down into the, you know, penalties down into the mid teens as opposed to 28. And that'll that'll be a player adjustment in my view, not a referee adjustment. Yep. Just as a feeling out period. Um, we, you know, boy, the, we're going to have some athletes who are getting more, more tired than they normally, more so than they normally get now, and that'll be a good thing because that opens the game up. The other thing is, and almost more importantly, is the offside. Right. So the way they're re- refereeing that is now, and they used to get the benefit of the doubt before this shit, before this competition, you got the benefit of the doubt. If you weren't clearly offside, you were onside. Now, if you're not clearly onside, you're offside. Right. So there's the difference, right? So they're refereeing it, and players will adjust. And boy, we're going to get, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get more movement in the game as a consequence of that, and that's a good thing. So that's going to space players more. So in other words, if you're on the you're line, right. you're on the line, you're considered on on onside unless proven offside. Yeah. The other way around. So it's going to give more space. Other way around. Turn yeah, around. it's going to turn yeah. it around. So if, if, if you if you couldn't be proven offside, you were onside. Now. Yeah. If you're clearly not onside, you're offside. Sounds like a bloody lawyer. And you lawyer. could still be onside and get penalised, right? So it's, it means that actually you've got to give a bit of yardage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't sit right on that iron foot. You've got to give half a yard, yeah, clearly. Yeah. Wow. Right? Which means you're going to not be able to come forward as hard. Therefore, there's going to be a little bit more space for the guys to run onto the ball. So I, I think the only other thing I'd like to see tidied up, in all honesty, I'd love to see the speed of the, the, the setting of the scrum sped up. I still right. think it takes too long. And I get the, I get the safety issue, paramount. 
but we can speed that up in my view. I, I mean, it takes a minute to set a scrum nowadays. I reckon we should be able to get that over in 30 seconds um, and then get on, you know, and you're going to get more tired athletes. And then the game opens up even more. Yep. And that, and, and there's no harm in that in my view. The other thing that needs to be sped up, in my opinion, is the uh, the replays. Yeah. When they're going up to the upstairs referee to have a look at it, I reckon they should bring in a rule that basically says if you can't make a decision based on replays in 30 seconds, then the guy on field has to make a call. You know, because sometimes yeah, you're sitting there for two and a half minutes looking at replays over and over and over again. I'm just like, come on, time to move, make a decision. I know. Yeah, I know. I agree with that. I mean, I, I think we saw an example of that on Sunday where um, it might have been one of the Blues tries, I think. And the referee, it was, it was it, and it looked like the pass may have been forward. It was one click, one click down. It's good enough. Go with the decision. So yep. I think we might have seen a bit of that on Sunday. I agree with you. Does my head in. <laughs> You know, and you're looking at it. You're not going to find a camera angle all the time that's going to give give you endorse you out. But the part of the problem is the answers in the question the referee asks. Yep. So you know, if you uh, I mean, so if you ask a question and you don't get evidence, the decision is made based on the based on the question. Yep. You know, can you see the ball clearly grounded, right? Or can you give me a reason not to award the try? They're different questions, yep. right? Correct. Yeah. So the it. referee then goes with his instinct. Okay, I, we can't see a ground him. I'm like, my, I, I think it's a try. That's what I'm going with, right? Because that's the question. Um, um, can you give me a reason not to award the try? Yep. Right. If you say, can you give me a reason to award the try? You look for absolutely clear evidence that he did, right? And when you got not enough cameras and angles, you got enough cameras. You just can't find an angle with all the bodies. Uh, and so I agree. You just got to. Sometimes it's like you know that's a try. Right, what are we mucking around for? Right, just, just get on with it. So so you have the ear of uh, many people who make decisions in this game, Foxy. So here's one for you. How about giving, much like the cricket, the captains of the team a challenge? Yeah. In other words, no, the, no. the referee has yeah. to call it, and the only, the only time it gets reviewed is if the captain of the other team uses one of their two review challenges, and if they get it wrong, they lose it. And I think that would well, be I, another way to do yeah. it. Yeah, I agree. But I, I still think we need a review because my it, it, livelihoods count on this, right? So we, we've got technology. We might as well use it, right? Just don't spend too much time using it yeah. and make sure we ask the right question when we are using it. Um, um, uh, but the challenge, uh, did, that was mooted. I know that for Super Rugby right. but I'm not, did it, I can't remember. Where it, obviously, it hasn't passed muster. I don't know. Um, but I reckon that's a great idea. But I'm not sure you use it or lose it. I think you may be allowed to use it once. Because you don't want if you because captains might be right, and you don't want to keep having to go there. It's not quite the same as cricket in that regard. So I yep. don't mind one challenge, or even if it was two, one in each half. You've got one, and and you can't whether you win or lose it. That's it. Right. And either the whole game or each half. But I love that idea because yeah. it puts some onus on on that. It just adds a bit of theatre, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. It has with cricket, hasn't it? It has with cricket yep. too. Yep, and then people don't review on cricket and they realise after the replays they should have. And, and that's right. And that's yeah. so that, then you've got to work out how to use the technology. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hey, um, uh, just a couple more quick things. Thanks for joining us. I wanted to ask about your boy. And um, yeah. because, obviously, professional golfer, I thought at the start of the lockdown, the two sports which probably could have continued on, one could have been tennis because they're yeah. already miles apart, and the other could have been golf. And obviously yeah. that's still all locked down. What's yeah. happening with his golfing career, like literally right. at the moment? Uh, look, he's um, not much, to be perfectly honest, because not much he can do. He plays on the European Tour. Um, that's not up and running yet. They're trying to get that up and running uh, at the end of July. Mm -hmm. um, but then he's got, he's got, uh, and they've changed the itinerary as a consequence because it's just obviously what, what's happened when you've been in lockdown. Uh, you know, be no crowds, there'll be no crowds and all that sort of stuff. It'll be like the PGA. Uh, event that was just run, the Colonial that was just run. Um, but the issue is for him is getting in, quarantine, what are they doing at that end and coming home? Because yep. he might have to go up, you know, potentially make three trips. And I don't think he's that keen to go for just six months um, on his own. So, um, you know, or five months on his own. So there are some issues around around that. Uh, you know, I mean, he played a tournament at Wairaki in the, re in the weekend, uh, which is a little bit of fun for him and it was a pro tournament which he won and won a little bit of money which is nice but essentially he hasn't earned any money since February yeah so and this is what he does for a living so you know it's it's I don't I think it's pretty hard to think of a one-size-fits-all here in terms of the rules and regulations I do think there should be a little bit of flexibility you know we have a COVID test uh, my view is that Ryan you know I think the European Tour are trying to get them in 
you know, without maybe testing and not quarantining. Right. And coming home, I think it should be my humble opinion for an athlete like him, you know, pretty much just someone come in, test. Maybe it's two days while you test. If it's clear, he can go home and then self isolate. Right. Um, right. And if he's not clear and he's got the he's got the virus, well, he's got no choice. He's absolutely got not a choice. Then he goes straight into quarantine. Mm. That's just my view. Um, I'd like to see some flexibility because I'd like my, my son, and I'm sure he wants it, the chance to go and do what he does for a living. Um, because otherwise, he might have to make a choice, and the choice might be, well, Christ, I don't play for the rest of the year, mm. which is not the choice he wants to make. The only good, the only thing around that is already got a status for next year. They've, the Europeans right. have already said. Because of what's happened, you've already got your status. So he's British Open qualified. That didn't happen this year. He's automatically got a spot for next year. Good. So he could make that choice on that basis. It just means he goes without earning money for a hell of a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, not not, not much going on. I mean, he trained during lockdown. He set up a gym at home in his in his garage. And you know, he couldn't really hit a golf ball. He did a bit of putting. He did a few sort of little pods podcasts himself to – for New Zealand golf and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that helped look after his sponsors and that sort of thing as mm-hmm. well. But um, you know, he, he physically trains. He's in pretty good shape at the moment. But yeah. he just couldn't do a lot. He was just swinging a golf club. I was looking at his Wikipedia page, um, and I noticed when you said you might play a bit heavier, five nine seventy two kilos at your playing weight. I see he's like five. Uh, I started playing first class rugby at 72 kilos. I actually, and so um, 12 years later, I was 83. So oh, okay. About a kilo a year I put on. Because he, much, so. um, his his stats say 510, so very similar size to you, but 98. Yeah. So he's obviously got a bit yeah. of bit of muscle on him. He's a solid lad. He's a solid lad. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, as selector for the All Blacks, uh, what's the chances of seeing a, a black jersey around there against an international team this year? Oh uh, well, certainly with Australia, I think pretty good. Um, and there is plans to hopefully play other teams. Um, and I. I'm not sure that anything's been announced yet, but so I better not say anything. Um, but I obviously have an idea of what they're planning. And you know, look, if if all the ducks line up in a row, then there's a chance we'll see the, the All Blacks play here a little bit this year, and more than just against Australia. And cool. Australia is obviously subject to the borders being open and all that sort of stuff. But um, there are there are plans of plans of foot. I mean, the good thing around this too, you know, Super Rugby will run its course. We'll have a North South game. Um, and there'll be a couple of blocks during Mighty 10 Cup um, at this point where the All Blacks will play, which will be the first time in a while. At the start of the competition, we could get the first three weeks with All Blacks available. I mean, you know, if things happen, there'll be a bit of international rugby and there'll be another block where I think All Blacks can go back again. So um, uh, that's the sort of the, the stuff I've seen. So, so, yeah, hopefully there's a good chance there'll be, there'll be a few games um, with a team playing in black. So we talked at the start of this conversation about how I... Um, remember my days watching Maris playing with JK only three metres away from me. This year is, I guess, the year to see All Blacks and NPC teams, which will probably be as close to that as we're going to get yeah. in this modern age anyway. Um, hey, look, I've, I have I hesitate to ask you these last questions because you've already told me how much you hate talking oh, yeah. about comparing errors. Um, but I did this with Josh Cronfeld, and I think it's a really interesting qu- uh, series of questions to ask. As an opinion-based yeah. question, I'd like to know from you who you think the greatest rugby player of all times is. Then, yeah. I, then I'd like to know from you who's the greatest you played with or against, in case it's a different yeah. person. And then I'd like for you, and I'll explain this one, who was the rugby player you most enjoyed watching? Okay. Because that might be so, someone different again. Right. So the the greatest player, I mean, my view, um, um, Reggie McCall. Okay. Right. Now, um, that's hard on some other players like um, um, Daniel Carter. Yep. And John Kerwin and Michael Jones, but um, McCaw's durability, um, you know, his longevity, um, the fact that you know he probably wasn't the most talented, but man, he he just he the talent he got out of himself and his ability to front game after game after game mm-hmm. was remarkable. So if I had to choose, yep. and I'm loath to, <laughs> but I've said it now, so I've done it. What was the next question? Uh, greatest you the played, greatest, greatest you played with or against. So, again, really tough question. Um, two for me really spring to mind, right? And they are Michael Jones and John Kerwin. So, for guys sure. I've already met, right? And that's tough on other players I, I played with or against as well. Um, out of that, um, um, I picked the Iceman uh, for one for, for one particular – I mean, he was a freak um, in the nicest sense of the word. Mm-hmm. Uh, mind you, the big fella on – you talked about big wingers. You talked about Inga. 
think JK might have been the big winger before Inger. Yeah, true. Because he was a big, a big man who was quick and had a step and a fend. And, but I, I reckon that this is the why I say Michael Jones. I honestly believe, you know, he played six and seven, we know that. But if you'd said to Michael, um, um, we're going to play a test match in two months' time and you're going to play with number 13 on your back or number 12, um, and we're going to give you four games, right, coaching in four games, I reckon he could have done it. All right. Seriously. Wow. That's how good I reckon he was. Um, um, so, um, so, and I see a lot of Michael now because I'm on the board of New Zealand rugby, so it's nice to sort of, you know, sort of reconnect in that way. Um, the the player, my direct opposition, um, and I'll talk about influence in a minute. I mean, the guy, my toughest opponent was Michael Liner. Right, on a, okay. on a regular basis. I played a lot against Michael, a hell of a good football player. Um, um one who left a great impression on me was Ollie Campbell, right? Uh, played against the Auckland Lions, 1983. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, you know, Auckland won that game, um, but we shouldn't have won it. We played in a wet, wet, shitty day at Eden Park. And the way Ollie drove the Lions around the park was just it left an imprint on me. And afterwards, he sought me out at the aftermatch function. We had a chat, and I thought that was a hell of a nice of him. So he, he left a heck of an impression. In terms of growing up, two come to mind to me. Brian Williams, never forget BG in 1970. He was a boyhood hero of mine. And I got the chance to play first class rugby with him. Wow. His last year was my his last year was my first year. So my and and I was taught by his wife, but was initially girlfriend, then fiance when I was at um in uh Prima two or uh, or something at Iraqa Heights in Pataru. His wife Leslie um taught me uh for a year. Um, but I remember watching BG in 70 and black and white in the South African black and white TV. Um, I was brought up on a farm in the Waikato and I, you know, I had a black jersey and black shorts and I made my mother cut out. Um, BG's number often was 13, <laughs> a black 13 and of a, a sheet and sew it on my back and a little silver fern. And I was a skinny little white kid, but Brian Williams was my hero. Right. And the other one who left a great impression was Barry John. 1971 Lions. He was this guy. He was a re- remarkable tactician. But I just lo- I, the influence of kicking goals. You know, just plant the ball down. And I know I took a lot more time than him, but just you know, round the corner. Um, you know, that influenced me enormously because I was brought up on a farm. My father was a rugby player. He was an, he was a fullback. He was a torpedo toe hacker, mm-hmm. right? And I, and growing up on a farm in the winter, you, there's a lot of frost around, particularly in the Waikato. So you know, trying to kick a rugby ball when you were blooming, what was that? 1971. What was I? I would have been nine years old. Eight and nine years, eight or nine years old, you know, break and basically my toes couldn't handle it. So I see this guy kicking around the corner. I thought actually that'll save my toes. Right. Oh, nice. And that was very well. So, so you know, when all of a sudden you kick on the instep on a cold winter morning, it's oh shit, that's okay. Didn't hurt my toes because I'm not using my toes. So, um, but they are, you know, just to rattle off a few names off the top of my head pretty quickly as people, you know, for me, um, massively. Um, admired and massively inf- influential for me. The the last question, and I'll give you a context for this: is the the player, past, present, whatever um, that you m- most enjoyed watching. And the example I often give for this is one of the cricketers I most enjoyed watching was Jesse Ryder. You know, you'd watch him, yep. you just never knew what was yeah, going to happen, whether it was going to be yeah. 100 off 35 balls or whether it was going to be out first ball. I just loved watching him in rugby. Pai Kokoriki Express, Christian Cullen was my favourite player oh. to watch. Um, do you have someone that jumps into your brain about, like, you knew they were playing, so you always wanted to keep an eye on that person? Well, actually, it, it, it's look, I could I could rattle off lots of them. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and this is not the one I'm really saying about, but remember Rupini, Thou, Thou, and Booker? Yeah, totally. On the blue. Mate, um, just during lockdown, you see some old stuff. Holy heck, that man could do some stuff. And quick. He wasted his talent. He wasted his talent, in my view, sadly. Mm. But, man, unbelievable. Um, the, but... And, and I'm glad you said Christian, right? Because if I'd have thought of it, I, I could have rattled off a lot of names. But but there's a thing I remember it was in, um, helping Murray Mexted coach in his rugby Iran's academy, coaching in Denver a long time ago. Ran academy in Denver, Colorado. Wow. Um, and we were uh, remember in a lunch break going upstairs, and and Cully was there actually. He was helping coach, and some of the American boys had got on 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 um, the internet, got on Google, and just Google Christian Cullen's greatest tries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. You actually forget how good he was. Yeah. Um, so, mate, watching him play, very special. 
Hey, um, this has been an absolute blast. I'm so thankful you gave us up some time to have a chat to today. I often talk about my enjoyment, although I am Dunedin-based, love this city, love where I'm living right now. You know, I grew up in Auckland and I have so many fond memories of being at Eden Park and I've told this story several times. The absolute arrogance of that uh, Renfrewly Shield defending team in the late 80s and the example I give with the... Um, maybe not of the players, right? I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back from that. But we we would hear the announcer at the stadium and let's say uh, let's say Manawatu was challenging for the Ranfield Shield. And I remember, I don't remember what team it was, but the announcer at the stadium saying literally something like, um, thanks for coming, Manawatu. We need the practice. And that was the kind of attitude around around the rugby in the 80s and Auckland and stuff. And I loved it. And the, you know, and the um, rivalry with particularly Canterbury, but, you know, Waikato as well and everybody else. It was a huge part. You you and your uh, teammates, huge part of my upbringing. Me and the old man, the old man used to have a, a sector of uh, the South Stand, I think it was, where he did the tickets for. So we'd always go along and do the tickets up in that corner and saw every game. Didn't make it to the spring box. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't um, um, what was it, the little stand. We had the after match, right, in the, in the little elephant house. Yeah. It's called the elephant house. Yeah. Was it that stand? No, it was in was the. That? It was right in the corner. It was the very like above the terraces where that uh, the I think it's the south stand uh, starts. Yeah. It was right in that very. Uh, there was a little triangular okay. one there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we used to. That's yeah. where. So that's where we'd sit every week because we'd go along with them and do the, you know, show people their seats. And one day Dave Loveridge turned up and he was on our in that stand. It was Dad was like, it was Dave Loveridge, and I'm like, oh crumbs, you know. So it was it was a really important part of my upbringing, and um, I'm just really happy uh, that you said yes and. That we've got a chance to not only re- reminisce but also talk a bit about the sport that I love so much and so many Kiwis do. So uh, thanks for joining us. It's been a it's been a huge amount of fun. My pleasure, Pat. No problem at all.